The Edwardian Country House has immersed 19 intrepid volunteers in one of the most opulent eras of British history. And they've been grappling with the social iniquities of the upstairs-downstairs regime. But I'm on an altogether gentler mission to revive the very best of the Edwardian lifestyle for the benefit of the 21st century pleasure seeker. I've even got my own Edwardian house to play in, with space enough to indulge in a little excess of my own. So, for the next six weeks, I'll be rustling up the treats of the time that I think are ripe for revival. I'll be bringing you the very finest dishes from the Edwardian dinner table, discovering how to pamper myself rotten, and finding out how to turn some of the simple things in life into works of art. But first of all, I'll be delving deep into the Edwardian obsession with all things floral. The Edwardians loved flowers and they took every opportunity to surround themselves with floral pleasures, not just in their gardens and drawing rooms, but in every corner of the Edwardian house. The Grand Country Estates grew flowers in profusion and often had them sent up to London to grace their houses in town. It was left to the Covent Garden flower market to keep the rest of the city in bloom, and a hundred years later, it's still going strong. Simon Lysett, floral decorator to the stars, is introducing me to some Edwardian favourites. So what catches your eye here, Simon? Well, I love these forget-me-nots. They're only little, but they are just, aren't they, dreams? You've gone straight for the smallest flowers I in have. the whole place, but they're, they're very pretty. Yes. An Edwardian flower, popular? Yes, them? very popular. Would have been used something like on a breakfast tray or something like that. Little dainty thing. Just little posies? Yes, yeah. Do you think the array of flowers on display here now is very different from what it was 100 years ago? Or was it more well, based it was the on start English Well, it was the start of refrigeration, so they were able to, to store and move flowers a bit more successfully, and things were able to be transported that much more. Uh -huh. And things like the chincherinches, which are these, which I love. With chincherinches? Chincherinches. Oh, chincherinches. silly name, isn't it? But they have the most wonderful little black centres. These look a bit like asparagus. They look like little insects sitting on the flowers, yes. don't they? And they would have waxed the stem ends of these, and that would have trapped the moisture that was in the stem within it, and then they were able to ship them all over the place, and they lasted for ages. So even then, it was a truly international flower market? Yes. So what are we actually going to take away with us today? Well, we've got all this to choose from. I don't know where to start, really. Let's go mad. Beautiful clove carnations. Right. Some hyacinths, which are just down here. The oh. whole box. Right. Some nice hydrangea. I'll follow you wherever you right. need to go, that's all right. Yellow carnation. Yeah. Irises. Lovely English lilac. Wow. Mm. One of those. They're what? very lovely. They're lovely, aren't they? They're quite heavy. Have a couple of those. Right, this way. I'm a walking Edwardian flower arrangement. You are. I've got a, a face full of sweet peas. Oh, well, it could be worse. Yeah, no, Back at his South head. London studio, Simon's promised to show me how to send a floral message Edwardian style, using their highly coded and, at the time, very fashionable language of flowers. Each flower had a different meaning. I mean, for instance, white lilac is innocent heart. So you can see that if you were sent some of that, then that's what you would understand it to be. So you're becoming quite fluent at the Edwardian language. I'm trying, with the help of that little book, which I've been referring to. You'll see it lists all the different types of flair in alphabetical order Goodness and what me. they mean. And God, it's quite a that, dictionary, isn't it? Yes, it is exactly that. There's some quite obscure things as well in there. So it's not, it's not just nice feelings. No, it's no. Hopeless. Melancholy, distrust. And if someone sent you a lettuce, that meant you were cold-hearted, but I sort of think you'd get to know that anyway. Especially with wilting a bit at yes. the edges. Ladies would have flower evenings where they would go around and instead of having your Tupperware party or your Anne Summers party, you'd actually would have a flower party and there would be a little group of women would get together and 
have a bunch of flowers each and make up some messages to send to one another. OK, why don't you send me a floral message? Right, and we'll see in if you can... In the Edwardian style. I'll see if you can interpret it. Now, it won't be the conventional bunch that we're all used to being sent and receiving these days. So we've got some birch, yes. some broom. Birch, broom, cherry tree. Cherry blossom. And Perhaps then... I should start looking some of these up. Yes. Cherry, cherry tree. Cherry tree. Good education. Purple lilac. Lilac purple. First emotions of love. Now you're talking, oh, Simon. Oh, now we're getting there. Birch. Birch, birch, birch. Birch meekness. Meekness. And I'm just putting in some ivy. And some a, ivy. As a finishing little flourish. Friendship, fidelity, marriage. Well, yes. now we're getting straight to the point. It's a proposition of sorts. So there we are. I think probably, yeah. I have to say, I don't know what it means, but it's turning into a very pretty bunch. A single white rose. And again, number's important then. I'm just tying it off with some raffia, which was very popular for the Edwardians and still what we tie our bunches up together with now. Our single white rose says, I am worthy of you. Oh. This is, you're not beating about the bush, Simon, no. are you? No put me out of my misery. Well, I had to write it down myself and translate it in a sort of modern way. I had thought, I love you, you're tidy and quiet, unloved but bright, friendly and faithful. I fancy being your first boyfriend and I'm up for it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very sweet gesture. Now that I'm fluent in flower speak, Valentine's Day will never be the same again. Back at the house, I feel even the flowers in my garden are starting to talk to me. And what these gorgeous primroses seem to be saying is, eat me. So I think I will. Jellies have been popular for centuries, particularly as a way of making a big visual splash at the end of a dinner. But until the Edwardian time, if you wanted to make jelly at home, you had to spend ages boiling up calves' feet to make your own gelatin. But then around the turn of the century, the first manufactured gelatin came on the market and everybody went jelly mad. Not just the chefs in the great Edwardian houses, but also the aspirational middle classes cooking at home. And for them, one of the simplest ways to make an extra visual splash in their jellies was to use some edible flowers they might find in the garden, like my primroses. They'll be the decorative highlight of a champagne jelly made from the zest and juice of oranges and lemons, some coriander, cloves and cinnamon for an aromatic note, the all-important bottle of fizz, caster sugar and water. The pan is put on a gentle heat and stirred to dissolve the sugar. Some leaf gelatin, pre-soaked in a little water, is added and dissolved. In order to display the flowers in the jelly, to their best possible advantage. The Edwardians like their jellies to be absolutely clear. And one way of clarifying them is to use eggshell and egg white. It's a trick chefs have been using for centuries. The broken eggshell and the lightly beaten white are whisked into the mix, where they'll pull together all the tiny particles that would otherwise cloud the jelly. As the mixture is heated to just short of boiling point, the egg white starts to set, trapping the particles. When the liquid is filtered through a jelly bag, the egg white and all the impurities stay behind, and the jelly to be trickles out crystal clear. And that's come out beautifully clear, and as soon as it's fairly cool, but not cold enough to set, we're going to start the little mould. So now we get to the decorative bit which is a little bit fiddly, but really not at all hard. First thing I have to do is just take the green base off the flower, because that tastes a little bit bitter. And everything that's left is really not just edible, but rather delicious. I'm going to put a, a small trickle of jelly at the bottom of the mould, which will be at the top of the unmoulded jelly. So that goes in. First, a single primrose flower goes onto the half-set jelly and a little more of the liquid is poured on top. The mould goes in the fridge until the jelly is lightly set. Then a circle of flowers goes on top of that 
and the process is repeated to build up the jelly in three or four layers until a couple of dozen primroses are held in a jewel-like suspension of champagne jelly. A quick dip in a pan of hot water loosens the jelly from the mould. This is always a slightly nerve-wracking moment. That is not bad. Now we do know that the Edwardians love their jellies. But what we don't know is whether Edwardian children said wibble wobble, wibble wobble jelly on a plate. But that is pretty fine. But even if you don't have a suitable mould, or if you can't face the psychological traumas of unmoulding, there is another extremely pretty way to serve this jelly. A champagne jelly in a champagne glass. And I'm going to taste one of these to see if the taste matches up to the visual experience. Mmm. And I think it does. Few flowers have generated as much excitement, as much danger, and frankly as much bad behaviour as the orchid. Writer Mark Griffiths is passionate about the flower, but luckily not quite as obsessed as his Edwardian forebears. What was it about the orchid that drove them so mad? Well, it has everything. I mean, apart from being beautiful, it's rare, it's extremely expensive, and it's very, very hard to grow. So it, so it beats racehorses, it beats keeping a string of expensive mistresses, it beats roulette, I mean, it beats anything you want. It's, it really was the top obsession absolutely. for the top people. Absolutely, It was a very, very Literally costly. beat them, not just kept up with them, but... Oh, no, no, these were things that people, people devoted all their resources to. I mean, it, it, so was, it was a mania. How bad did it get? Well, orchid mania, certainly by the Edwardian period, um, was a, a matter of rape, pillage and power. We still hadn't worked out properly how to reproduce orchids uh, in, in cultivation, so that most of the orchids that were being sold, often for huge prices at auction houses in London and Liverpool, were plants that were collected from nature. For example, the, the famous blue orchid. Uh, when, when that was found in its Himalayan stronghold, the instruction came from London to the collector that he should destroy every plant that he actually couldn't bring back. And that was a very common practice. So environmentally, this was atrocious. It behavior. was atrocious, but you weren't going to let your rivals follow you or indeed pip you to the post. It's all very well having a hothouse full of fancy orchids, but if you wanted to get out there and strut your stuff and impress the women, how did you display them? You'd wear them in your buttonhole. And were there are, some species that were particularly Yes, there were some that were particularly favoured. Um, this is a Dontoglossum crispum from Colombia, which was, again, collected almost to the point of extinction at that time. And that was the thing to wear with, with your morning coat. It was a chest-beating display for the men, wasn't it? Look, I can afford to grow this thing. Not only can I afford to, to, to pay for somebody to, to go out and collect it from the field, endangering his own life, but I can then afford to lay on a spectacular orchid house like this in order to keep it alive. Why do you think the orchid in particular lends itself to, to this idea of, of strutting sexual display? Well, the whole thing is, is sex. I mean, the word orchid means testicle. Does it? Yes. And I mean, since, since Greek times, they've been used as fertility symbols because of the resemblance of the roots, supposedly, to our genitalia, right? So they're, they're these things. Not these, no. I mean, the, the European orchids have a, a pair of spherical roots, OK? <laughs> OK. Uh, so they were aphrodisiacs. So do you think orchid fever is starting to bite again? Definitely. Millions of orchids are sold every year now, and they're not just being grown by aristocrats. It's now the most popular plant that's coming out of the Dutch flower markets. It's cheaper than a red rose now. I can normally kill a houseplant just by looking at it but I'm determined to make an extra special effort to take care of my luscious moth orchid in its new home. Before 1900, perfume was seen as rather vulgar, but an Edwardian lady would have felt as naked without it as she would without her corset. And the most popular scents of the day were inspired by flowers. The beauty of scent is that you can take your favourite floral aroma and bottle it to enjoy at your leisure. It was a sensual pleasure that obsessed the Edwardians, 
and inspired them to take the art of perfumery to new heights. Their dedication set the style for modern fragrances. Chris Sheldrake, one of the finest noses in the business, has a passion for the authentic sense of the era. So this is like a, a museum of smell. Everything that was around in the Edwardian times, or a lot of it anyway, has been preserved and, and kept up to the mark. Absolutely. L'Oregon was a fragrance created in 1905. So slap in the middle of the Edwardian era. Absolutely. Is there a technique to this? Just put Just it in like front this, of the nose yes. and sniff. It's quite heady. It's quite, quite a... It is, it is very, very heady. It's very rich, very long-lasting. So we have the vanilla right on the top note, and that brings us down to a fragrance which smells of carnation. Carnation and violets. It's a very feminine smell. It's very, it gets very floral, and, and it's a real heady bouquet. Mm. What had happened to make this kind of thing possible for the Edwardians? Perfumes in the past contained ingredients that were easy to extract and easy to bottle. And what was happening in chemistry was the invention of synthetic chemicals that smelt like lily of the valley or uh, violet flowers or um, lilac. So they were keen on complex floral fragrances, but ironically they were actually using synthesized chemicals to get them. And don't forget, in a fragrance like this, they are blended with very expensive natural ingredients too. Should we have a look at another one? At yeah, what else have you time? got? Well, at the same time, there was the, the famous Rose Jacques Minot by Coty. Francois Coty, having created La Rose Jacques Minot, took it to Les Grands Magasins du Louvre to try and get the buyer to put it on the shelves there. This was the fancy store in Paris at the, the time. The great store at the time. And the buyer wouldn't have it. And Francois Coty was so angry that as he left the store, he threw the bottle on the ground where it smashed. And following this, many, many customers wanted to know where the fragrance was coming from and could they have one. <laughs> and, uh, A cunning and, piece of marketing, yes, in fact. Yes, and so you can imagine the, the buyer quickly called him up and asked him if he could stock it. <laughs> it's quite different, isn't it? Completely. Now, this is a beautiful fragrance, and there wasn't a rose fragrance like it before. It's always been uh, a flower that everybody has wanted to make, and this is probably one of the greatest examples in history of a rose fragrance. And the gentry were shelling out pretty big bucks on perfume. There was no limit, and I think Coty was one of the first to really understand that um, a fragrance was a work of art, and it had to be packaged like a work of art. And he was one of the first people to work with a great bottle designer, René Lalique. And uh, there's no doubt that the combination of Coty fragrances and René Lalique bottles just made such fragrances as, uh, as L'Oregon uh, one of the greatest successes of the, of the time and one of the greatest influences in perfumery. Back in my period house, I'm in the kitchen, cooking up a highly scented Turkish delight one of the most fashionable and fragrant after-dinner sweets of the day. They like to flavour their Turkish delights with heady, aromatic flower waters made from orange blossom and roses. And although these had been around since the Crusades, they gained hugely in popularity with the Edwardians, who'd really started to travel. Some of them might even have made it as far as Istanbul, where, with a bit of luck, they got to taste the real thing. Into my rose-scented sugar syrup, I'm dissolving a few leaves of soaked gelatin. The syrup is boiled hard for five minutes, and a few drops of pink colouring adds a final exotic touch. The hot mixture is poured into a wetted tin and left to set firm in the fridge. To prevent it sticking to everything it touches, turn the Turkish Delight out onto a sieved mixture of icing sugar and corn flour. Dust the surface with the same mixture and cut it into squares with a sharp knife. And it's ready to eat. The truly Turkish companion to this sweet and sticky confection is a glass of fresh mint tea. For my final floral treat, 
I've come to Haworth, Yorkshire, where the town's apothecary has been restored to its former glory. Underpinning the whole enterprise is a firm belief in the power of flowers to excite the senses, soothe the mind and pamper the body. It's the passionate project of mother and daughter team Patricia and Caroline Rose. So what inspires you about the Edwardian era? The luxury, the opulence, the design, everything. It's just, it was just a wonderful opulent era. And flowers were a pretty central part of smelling good and feeling good they and were. looking good? They were. They formed the principal part of most of the products that we use. Most of the ingredients that we use contain flowers, lavender, roses, geranium, violet. That lovely lavender that you're scooping there, Patricia, what would the Edwardians have used that for? They would have used the sprigs of lavender, they would have placed it between the sheets, um, not just to make the, the sheets smell fragrant, but also to keep away moths because it's an insect repellent. So they would have used lavender abundantly in the wardrobes and cupboards and they would have put it into muslin with sea salt to have a bath and made the lo lovely sort of lace sachets and all this sort of thing. Shall I have a go? Have a go. OK, all you need is a piece of muslin, sea salt. Or salt lavender. first, It doesn't, doesn't matter which way, it doesn't matter at all. OK, I'll go for the salt first. That's enough. That's yeah. fine. Yeah. And your lavender. Oh, That's am I overdoing it there? Yes. About that? That's fine. And then okay. your oil, your essential oil of lavender. It's all right to put the oil on the lavender rub? It is, yeah. yeah. Okay. It's just we usually put it onto the salt because it absorbs it. That's enough. Perhaps I need a bit of extra. <laughs> Bring up the corners. Yep. See, this is the kind of bit that I... No, that's bit. good. Yeah, that's that... perfect. Oh, Let yes. it all drop to the bottom. And then your little ribbon. Little twist? Yeah, a little twist, then your ribbon. Just, um, yeah, that's, that's better. Right. Wrap it round. <laughs> Hang on. For some reason, I need four pairs of hands to do this. Okay. Tie your knot. Ah, ah. Okay. And then a knot at the end so it can hang over the tap. Okay. Have Not bad. Mine, mine seems to be a bit of a dumpling compared to yours. <laughs> so when you turn the tap on, the hot water's going to trickle through there That's right. and bring out all the lavender scent yeah. and dissolve some of the salts into the bath. Mm -hmm. which, which are very therapeutic. Who'd have thought getting clean could be so deliciously decadent?